It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. He's ready to go. Big trouble in big IP. We'll talk about that. The Garmin ransomware breach, disk benchmarking, and another reason why you should be very afraid of GNU TLS. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Security Now comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson. Episode 777, recorded Tuesday, July 28th, 2020. RWX, RWX, RWX. This episode of Security Now is brought to you by Barracuda. Did you know that 91% of all cyber attacks start with an email? To uncover the threats hiding in your Office 365 account, get a secure and free email threat scan at barracuda.com slash security now. And by... ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your ISP can't see the sites you visit. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash security now. And by Roman. Skip the waiting room and awkward face-to-face. -face. Get ED medication conveniently delivered to your door in discreet, unmarked packaging. Go to GetRoman.com slash security now for a free online visit and free two-day shipping. It's time for Security Now, the show we where we protect you and your loved ones by setting your permissions high. This is the, uh, this is the guy who puts the wall up protects us all, Mr. Steve Gibson from GRC.com. Hey, Steve. Hello, Leo. Great to be with you again. This is a landmark episode, 777. Triple seven. And uh, we have a, a fun show title, too, for those those uh, geeky among us. RWX, RWX, RWX. Now, let me ask you, when you use CHMOD... Do you prefer CHMOD 777 or oh, do no. you prefer U plus RWX? Oh, I see. The, 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 uh, style. the no, letters? I like to explicitly specify you like numbers. exactly what I'm looking for. You know, like 640 is. Yeah, because uh, you know in your head what 640 is. That's why. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I Occasionally, if I want to turn the execute bit on, I'll just do U plus X. But most yeah. of the time, it's easier just to do the number. Yeah. I agree with you. So uh, we've got a uh, an interesting episode. I'm uh, nothing really stood out, and one thing that's really that's interesting has happened in this past week is that some truly surprising and interesting results have been emerging from what has turned out to be a a hyper accurate storage benchmark that. I'm working on for the technology for Spinrite. Um, so I, I, there's some interest. I, I just know that our listeners, odd as it sounds, when, and you, you too, Leo, when you see this stuff, you're going to be going, what the what? Anyway, uh, we're going to start with security. Uh, we're going to look at the trouble that F5 Network's big IP devices are now having. We talked about this at the beginning of the month when it was a warning that, uh-oh, patch. Um, we're going to update on the, uh, what is, I guess, two weeks ago now, epic Twitter hack. There's more information coming to light. Uh, we're going to look at a, an important security update for GNU TLS and those applications that are relying on it and hopefully uh, either have been patched or will be soon because there's a... Uh, glaring problem. We're going to cover the big five-day Garmin outage, in quotes, and and I'm going to break my promise. Well, it wasn't it wasn't a hard set-in-stone promise never to talk about ransomware again, because when something significant happens, it's just not, not I'm not talking about it every week anymore. Uh, and we're also going to talk about Cisco's latest troubles. Um, I've had a pointer, actually from Bleeping Computer, to a new Windows 10 debloater app, 
and we have a bit of errata, then, as I mentioned, I want to wrap up by sharing some of the really interesting results that are emerging as a result of the fact that I've ended up developing what is turning out to be a what I would describe as a hyper-accurate storage benchmark. We're getting results accurate to four significant digits, and it's revealing some surprising things about our mass storage. So I, I think an interesting podcast for our listeners. Yeah, you know, ransomware feels like it's gotten nastier and worse. Oh, Leo. Yeah. <laughs> it just really feels that way, doesn't it? It's like uh, yeah, we knew it would get for us worse. To talk but, it. We, we yeah. need to touch, touch, touch in on it again because it really has. Actually, it ties to our uh, sponsor uh, for this hour. There was a really good piece uh, last week in uh, Bloomberg Business Week on the Norsk Hydro ransomware attack. I don't know if you read that. Yep. It was a really good yep. It, it was actually chilling because it was uh, so devastating to this, the largest aluminum manufacturer in the world. Um, they're all over the place. And this is back in March 2019. But one of the details revealed I thought was really interesting was how they got attacked. It was an email from an Italian customer, an expected email that got mm. hijacked midway. Conversation hijacking. And the, so the bad guys were able to intercept the inbound email on its way to Norse Hydro and replace the safe normal attachment with a malicious attachment. Wow. But it went right into Norse Hydro. And because it was expected, it was from a customer. They knew it was coming. The attachment was exactly what they expected. Their normal kind of caution, I guess, thrown to the wind. And so no fault at their end. I mean, none. It, they got bit. And it took, it cost them 60 million dollars to mitigate even though they had cyber insurance it was truly devastating and uh, that just shows you how that's really the big risk vector at this point 91 percent of all cyber attacks start with an email the other story is that they got bit in december that that's when the attackers got in the attackers didn't actually set off the ransomware until march they wandered the network undetected for months right it's it's such a good cautionary tale. I highly recommend it. And one more reason you ought to be using Barracuda. Uh, Barracuda, as everyone knows, a well-known provider of cloud-enabled enterprise-grade security devices and software. Uh, but I tell you, most big businesses, you go in, there's going to be a Barracuda device in the rack. They will help protect your email, your network, your data, your applications. And now... Reading stories like this, hearing about this or the Garmin attack, knowing that 91% of these attacks come through email, I think it's very smart of you. Uh, if you have a business, if you're responsible for security, if you own the business, if you're the IT department, to start thinking about all of that email flooding in. And it's not just flooding now into your network, because if you've got employees at home, it's going into their house. It's coming through their systems. That's a perfect way to do that man in the middle that they did to Norse Hydro, right? Uh, think about how vulnerable you are. Spear phishing, ransomware, account takeover, conversation hijacking has happened uh, in this case. And you've got all those employees out there, thousands of mail emails a day. And all it takes is one click on the wrong email. It's going to cost you money, your customers, your reputation. $60 million for Norsk Hydro and, and many, many days of mitigation. And they did everything right. You need Barracuda. That's one more thing you could do right. Uh, since uh, February, Barracuda's researchers have observed a spike of 667%, 667% of coronavirus-related spear fixing attacks. These are very effective because we're getting emails from the company about, you know, what our coronavirus plans are, or maybe from the World Health Organization. And by the way, they completely impersonate WHO. Here's important information from WHO or the CDC. These guys are good. You need Barracuda Total Email Protection. This is such a great solution. It includes four different uh, features. You have an all-in-one email security tool that's going to scan your Outlook inbox if you have an Office 365 inbox and completely prevent this exact kind of hijacking, it would have seen that malicious attachment and blocked it. They also support uh, backup and archiving. That's a legal requirement in many 
uh, businesses. You get AI-based protection from spear phishing, account takeover, and business email compromise. Because the bad guys are constantly evolving, your protection has to evolve. You get an automated incident response. This is really important. The faster you act, the faster you can mitigate, the less the damage. This automated incident response will give you options so you can quickly and efficiently address attacks. Also, security awareness training. you got to educate your workforce. They can't be the only line of defense, but they certainly are right there on the front lines. Your employees need to know what to look for, what to avoid. Right now, new attacks coming out all the time. You need the security and safety of your business insured with Barracuda. Barracuda Total Email Protection to uncover the threats hiding right now in your inbox. <laughs> if, you, if you've been listening, you might want to do this right now. Go to barracuda.com slash security now. You'll get a free email threat scan of your Office 365 account. The whole thing. Free. Risk-free. No charge. Barracuda, B-A-R-R-A-C-U-D-A dot com slash security now. Barracuda is your journey secured. Barracuda. Barracuda.com slash security now. Please use that so they, they know you heard it here with Steve. I've got a picture. We have a picture. And it's, first of all, I should describe it. Uh, we have a, a, a somewhat unhappy, shocked looking computer <laughs> user who's staring at the screen, which is announcing you have 10 updates. And it says six, slow your PC down. Three, look very dodgy. One, randomly changes all your PC settings. Must be using Windows 10. And, well, <laughs> yeah. And, and so on one hand, there's the cartoon itself. But what occurs to me is sort of the meta level, which is that so, some cartoonist created this cartoon because it's now like in the popular culture. I mean, it's, it's, it's enough of a problem Good that point. it's not yeah. – geek land it's talking not just about us. this. Yep. Yeah, it's like, oh, I mean, like everybody knows this. It's like, this is not going to be good for me. I mean, I have to do it, I guess. Well, actually, now it's not a guess. Yes, you know, Microsoft will make you do it. But you do it and like random things happen, which, <laughs> which don't, aren't clearly in the customer's best interest. So anyway, I just, I thought it was interesting. Not only that, yes, okay, sure, you know, funny cartoon. But the fact of the funny cartoon, you know, the fact that 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 somebody is drawing a cartoon that says this says, you know, wow, uh, we're not really doing a service for our customers in the industry all the time. Um, so at the at the very end of last month, I think it was June thirtieth, uh, F five Networks released a critical patch for their so-called big IP systems. Um, it was a maximum vulnerability, as the way it was termed, remote code execution flaw that say, they disclosed. It don't get worse than this, baby. <laughs> <laughs> in their so-called uh, TMUI, the Traffic Management User Interface of the big IP, which is actually, you know, like a trademark I don't know what it stands for. I mean, IP, we know, Internet Protocol, but big. Maybe it stands for something other than just big. Uh, their Application Delivery Controller, ADC, big on initials here. Uh, anyway, this came to light as a consequence of F5 publishing this patch. Uh, and with it was an urgent call for users of these so-called big IP systems to immediately update with the highest possible priority. Um, and big, big, or <laughs> big, big IPs. F5's customers using these big IP solutions are governments, Fortune 500 firms, banks, service providers, well-known brands, including Microsoft, Oracle, and Facebook. I mean, you know, this is big iron. So... As we noted at the time, F5's website boasts that 48 of the Fortune 50 rely on F5. So somehow they missed two, two of the top 50 companies in the U.S. Um, 
And at the time of the disclosure, so not quite, but almost a month ago, more than 8,000 of these big IP F5 networks devices were found online, publicly accessible on the internet, and vulnerable to attacks designed to exploit this vulnerability. U.S. Cyber Command urged F5, like independently urged F5 customers to patch their devices urgently. They tweeted, patching CVE 2020, 5902, and 5903 should not be postponed over the weekend. Remediate immediately. Wow. F5 also offered some interim mitigation measures that they recommended for their customers who could not, for whatever reason, patch their big IP, big IP equipment immediately. You know, sometimes that requires you take it down for some length of time and, and reboot. But it later came to light that the mitigation could be mitigated and bypassed which made emergency patching the only safe course. Like, you know, do it now. So two days after the patches for this critical vulnerability were released, researchers started publicly posting proof of concept exploits showing just how easy it would be to exploit them. So that was then. Three weeks later, last Friday the 24th, the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, posted. They said, CISA is issuing this alert in response to receiving to recently disclosed exploits that, that target F5 big IP devices that are vulnerable to blah, blah, blah. Um, unpatched big five, I'm sorry, unpatched F5 big IP devices are an attractive target for malicious actors. Affected organizations that have not applied the patch to fix this critical remote code execution vulnerability risk an attacker exploiting that CVE to take control of their system. Note, F5 security advisory states that there is a high probability that any remaining unpatched devices are likely already compromised. CISA expects to see continued attacks exploiting unpatched big, uh, F5 big IP devices and strongly urges users and administrators to upgrade their software to the fixed versions. CISA also advises that administrators deploy the signature included in this alert to help them determine whether their systems have been compromised. And so the, the, the signature was a, uh, a, a, a traffic inspection uh, uh, script in order to see whether there was bad stuff going on. They said CISA has observed scanning and reconnaissance as well as confirmed compromises within a few days of F5's patch release of this vulnerability. As early as July 6th, CISA has seen broad scanning activity for the presence of this vulnerability across federal departments and agencies. This activity is currently occurring as of the publication of this alert, meaning, okay, from as early as July 6th is when it began, and this, this alert was last Friday, the 24th. So this has been going on. They conclude, CISA has been working with several entities across multiple sectors to investigate potential compromises relating to this vulnerability. CISA has confirmed two compromises and is continuing to investigate. CISA, CISA will, alert, will update this alert with any additional actionable information. Okay, so... You know, th this is a classic example, and actually this sort of ties into where we'll be going here in a minute when we talk about Garmin. Um, you know, I've often, sp I've often been speaking about the growing critical need for companies and to a lesser degree individuals, but certainly individuals who care, to be certain that they have and are maintaining an open channel of communication for receiving vulnerability notices. I've been talking about email as that channel. But in thinking about this further, I think that Twitter likely makes the most sense now. 
Um, as I noted last week, Twitter really has become our global information dissemination platform, you know, warts and all, and for better or for worse. Uh, as I, you know, uh, it's um, no one imagines that the announcement of critically patched vulnerabilities won't immediately be public anyway. Typically, these things are made public, and any company that tried to send out pr th email thinking that to a large customer base, thinking that it would not end up immediately coming to everyone's attention, is, is nuts. So it ought to be broadcast. I'm sure the bad guys have signed up to receive vulnerability announcements uh, in email from all of these providers anyway. And no one is, you know, making sure that this is that an announcement like this is, is not going out. The CVEs are, are, are overtly public. So, so it seems to me the way this needs to work is for technology companies to, that is who are producing these things to create an authenticated vulnerability announcement, Twitter account, which never, contains corporate promotional nonsense. They, you know, it's in the company's interest to keep that vulnerability announcement channel named specifically for that purpose and clean and dedicated to nothing but the disclosure of the availability of important updates to correct, you know, wh which are meant to correct important security vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, and it should be seen as beneficial to its reputation that it's committed to getting this news out as as quickly as possible in a in a flash fashion. You know, I mean, the one thing they could do would be to time it so that the the areas where it's most likely to be affected are awake. So, you know, don't send it out at 2 a.m. That's not going to be good. You know, wait till maybe after morning coffee has <laughs> had a chance to take hold. Um, and a company's record of its disclosure of these things over time, evidenced by its past feed of, of, of such things, should be a point of pride for the company and seen as an aspect of security for its prospective and ongoing customers. And if an enterprise's entire IT security team were to subscribe to the to the security vulnerability Twitter feeds of the set of vendors whose hardware and software they're using, then even if one person missed it because they were, you know, in the car or driving, you know, I mean, the, the point is, if it's a broadcast, it's not going to one person who got laid off last week and and corporate IT forgot to you know keep looking at at that person's corporate email for for important alerts instead it you know everybody in the security team gets it somebody is going to escalate this thing and take action when they should it just the model we're seeing now is that it is a race you know when we, when we every month now we or week we we see instances where something important occurs the bad guys are now i mean they're organized they are arguably are more organized than it that's got other stuff on its plate than just doing security vulnerability remediation you know they're trying to move other strategies forward the bad guys have nothing but badness you know uh, that they're looking at so I just think it's 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 really worth thinking about how, you, as as somebody in IT, you can give your company an edge. And it's on on the flip side, the the that the companies that are producing this should not be sending this feed out in their standard. PR where, you know, it's it, the, 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 the feed ends up being bogged down with all kinds of other stuff that doesn't invite its attention. And and a, a company producing a security alert on a Twitter account wants it to be an account for that purpose. That way, on the receiving end, the IT team can can be subscribing to these things and know they're important and not have them just, you know, buried in a bunch of noise. So 
I just, you know, emails, yes, that too. But I just think it's important for announcements to get out more now than ever. And speaking of Twitter, uh, it's obvious in retrospect uh, that if high profile accounts were compromised so that attackers were able to obtain login access, they would or could have also nosed around in the normally private DM channels of those accounts. It's not something that was talked about last week, but it has since come to light. That is, not only were those compromised accounts used for sending out that, you know, two for one Bitcoin deal, uh, which, you know, was crazy, but, you know, it <laughs> it did try to make some money. And as we know, uh, the, the transfers of what, $240,000 in Bitcoin generated by that little brief campaign uh, was blocked to, to, you know, to everyone's benefit. Twitter updated, uh, I don't remember when it was, oh, on the 22nd of, of um, uh, which was Wednesday last week, they updated their original blog posting, adding this little bit of information. They said, we believe that for up to 36 of the 130 targeted <laughs> accounts, the attackers accessed the DM inbox, including one elected official in the Netherlands. Remember, they to said date, eight at first. Uh-huh. Right. Right. And they said, to date, we have no indication that any other former or current elected official had their DMs accessed. So, you know, not surprisingly, the news that some of the world's most influential people probably had their personal messages read by hackers who are still unknown, at least to publicly to us, will put additional pressure on Twitter to better protect its users. And U.S. Senator Ron Wyden, who's generally one of the more technically savvy politicians, you know, he's on top of these these various issues of uh, encryption and technology and so forth. Um, he said that he has pushed Twitter's CEO – of course, Jack Dorsey, to protect direct messages with end-to-end -end encryption. Ron said, Twitter DMs are still not encrypted, leaving them vulnerable to employees who abuse their internal access to the company's systems and hackers who gain unauthorized access. If hackers gained access to users' DMs, this breach could have could have a breathtaking impact for years to come. And of course, from Twitter's standpoint, it would be a big feather in its cap if it could boast true end-to-end -end encryption for private DMs. Um, the idea, of course, would be that neither Twitter nor anyone else except the tweet's intended recipient would be able to read the tweets. And... You know, thinking of it from a standpoint of a crypto challenge, I'd love to be given the job of designing that system since it represents a number of interesting challenges. But probably the best person anywhere would be Matthew Rosenfeld, whom we commonly refer to as Moxie Marlinspike. I didn't know that was Matthew, his real name. or rather uh, Moxie, uh. Uh, and his crypto team at Signal would be best suited to designing end-to-end -end encryption for Twitter. I still recall how weirdly over-designed the Signal protocol appeared to me at first when I was digging into it for our, for our in-depth episode on that. But, you know, that feeling morphed into deep technical appreciation once I saw that their crypto, what it was that their crypto ratchet and other mechanisms that they had created, you know, what features and flexibility it enabled, you know, and that's the sort of design expertise and inevitable crypto mistake, mistake sidestepping that Twitter needs. Uh, if anyone out there at Twitter is listening, and if you have any interest in following up on Ron Wyden's end to end encryption suggestion, please, 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 don't roll your own 
brand new ad hoc solution. Uh, I'll bet Moxie and his team would welcome a new and, and high profile challenge. And, and Leo, what, what has Twitter talked about with, with regards to security? Do you know if this is on their plate? I, you know, I don't understand how encryption, I mean, it would only be for DMs, obviously. Uh, only DMs. Because anything and, public. And it would have to be <laughs> no per point. device. It would be tied to devices. I don't know why they should, to be honest, since Signal exists. Um, I think it's bending Twitter to do something, you know, different. It's really not, not, it's not, not suited to. for. So, like, no, yeah. nobody should receive or send, like, sensitive content over DMs. No, you should – well, we know you shouldn't do that. <laughs> right, now, right now, that's clearly a bad idea, and I, I, I hate to give people the impression that it would be safe to do so. I mean, if, of course, if, if they enabled, enabled the signal protocol, that, that would be. Uh, but, you know, there's ways to enable it that maybe are less secure. You know, WhatsApp uses the signal protocol, but does that mean that Facebook doesn't have the keys? Uh, I don't know if the keys are device only. So – it's an interesting question. I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, if you're going to do it, that's the way to do it. You're absolutely right. right. I think it's a mistake to just say, look, we have a secure messaging system built within Twitter. It just doesn't seem like part of the mission. Right. And it does feel like it doesn't fit with right. Twitter's, you know, inherently it's sort public. of open, yeah. you know, casual approach. Yeah. DMs, <clears throat> to me, on Twitter are properly used as a way to take a battle with another person private, say, look, let's just handle this in DMs or saying waving at somebody or saying, hey, let's talk. Um, I'm not sure it should be used for private communications. Yeah, for me, I think, although I famously don't follow anyone, I know from looking at other people's feeds, they're following 1,300 people. Oh, yeah. And, and so for me, a DM is a means of bringing something to someone's attention that... You know, I would like them not to miss. And in fact, that's the I know that's the way our listeners use DMs to me is, right. you know, for exactly that purpose. It's like, Steve, you know, the, the, this, you know. Uh, well, they do that because you're not following anybody. Because right. if you were, I mean, they could at you in a public way, which is where most people do that on Twitter. And I do watch that. I, right. I watch all of our listeners, you know, adding SGGRC. And so I sort of, I, I see those things go by. Right. But were I following, you know, hundreds of people who are tweeting, it's like it'd be just easy to see it, you know, to lose it in the scroll. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's no re I guess there's no reason not to do it if it's implemented properly. You know, what, what Twitter is really trying to do, I mean, bottom line, besides the embarrassment uh, of you know not getting hacked, is to make money. They And they've had a hard time figuring out how to do that. Their advertising isn't working very well for them. They... They had a tough quarter again. Now they're looking at a subscription model. So maybe that would be a subscription feature and then encrypted uh, direct messaging. Well, and we know that they gave up on SMS. So they had to give up on SMS. You used to be able to send a DM via right. SMS. And but, that would be inherently but that, insecure. But that says no client on the sender's side. Right. So we can't do end to end that way. Yeah, I mean, I could. Yeah, maybe they will do it. I know it's interesting. Yeah. Um, we're moving along at a good clip, Leo. Let's take our, our second okay. break. Moving along at a good clip. That's unheard of, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Still plenty to talk about. Um, there, there's been some conversation back and forth about uh, the fact that Mozilla now offers a VPN. I have to say, I don't, you know, somebody said, are you using it? And I said, I don't have to. I've got the best VPN on the market, and I'm very happy with it. It's ExpressVPN. I'll tell you uh, why I use ExpressVPN, and I've not had the need, felt the need to look beyond it. Um, there are a couple of reasons you use a VPN, a virtual private network. It encrypts your traffic between your computer and the VPN server, and then at that point, it emerges into the world. So just that sentence alone gives you three, the three benefits. One is because your traffic's encrypted between you and the, the server, nobody can snoop on you in the intermediate area, including your internet service provider, or your cell phone carrier. And we know they do snoop. In fact, it's completely legal for them <clears throat> to record where you go, what you do, all your DNS lookups, uh, and sell that to marketers. That's why DNS uh, over HTTPS has suddenly become 
an issue. Well, I would submit VPNs even better, but it encrypts all that traffic. The, 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 the ISP has no insight at all into what you're doing. It just sees an encrypted tunnel. That's it. So that's, that's reason one, privacy. Security, obviously, because if you have a man in the middle, if you are an open Wi-Fi access point, for instance, and somebody's on the network with you, you don't want to be floating passwords and other information through the air. Uh, you want to encrypt it. That's part two. The third reason is a little more subtle. <clears throat> and actually, it's one of the main reasons I use ExpressVPN. I, I really like the privacy thing. I don't use open Wi-Fi access points much these days. Uh, but I love the idea that you can emerge at any... They're in more than 90 countries. So you can emerge in any one of those 90 countries. And you look like your traffic's coming from that country, from that IP address. That's very good. That's very valuable. Because it means, for instance, I fire up Netflix, turn on ExpressVPN. But uh, instead of letting it use its smart technology to pick the fastest server, I say, no, I want to use uh, London because I want to look at Doctor Who episodes on Netflix London. Boom, I'm in London, refresh Netflix, suddenly I'm getting all the Netflix episodes. And you can do that on ExpressVPN, not, not only because they have locations in 90 plus countries, but also because they're fast. They are absolutely the fastest VPN. So fast you won't know you're on a VPN and certainly fast enough to watch high def video over it. That's, that's something a lot of VPNs can't claim to. We know that ExpressVPN is private. That's come up lately with some other so-called non-logging VPNs turning out to be logging VPNs. We know ExpressVPN is private. And here's how I know. First of all, independent audits of their privacy policy and this trusted server technology say they're private. They do what they say they do. The trusted server technology is ExpressVPN going the extra step. They actually wrote this technology so that when you log into the server, it spins up the, the, the VPN server, the clients logging into the server, in RAM at that VPN server, can't write to disk. It's actually sandbox, completely sandbox, cannot write to disk. And then when you leave, when you disconnect, it's gone. And so is every trace of your visit. And the independent audit said that's exactly what it does. We also have some other kinds of audits, because from time to time, law enforcement will storm the ExpressVPN offices and take the servers with them, hoping to get some information, and they're always empty. They're never, <laughs> never, and I can point you to three or four cases where that's happened. So we know ExpressVPN is doing exactly what they say. No matter where you are, even at home, you want to use ExpressVPN. Security privacy, eliminate geographic restrictions. It's also very affordable. Less than seven bucks a month. You got to pay for a VPN. You got to. Otherwise, they're finding other ways to make money off of you. Protect your online activity today with a VPN rated number one by CNET, number one by Wired, and the one I use, expressvpn.com slash security. Now, you could actually get a better deal three months free with the one-year package expressvpn.com slash security now that's expressvpn.com slash security now you'll get three extra months free with your one year package steve it's a good starter deal it is a good deal yeah yeah so um we've often referred to open ssl as the standard uh but as we know it's becoming quite long in the tooth uh, professor of cryptography Bill Buchanan recently summed up the situation <laughs> with OpenSSL writing in Medium. He said, OpenSSL has caused so many problems in the industry, including the most severe with Heartbleed. The problem with it is that it has been cobbled together and maintained on a shoestring budget. And we've talked about this uh, in the past. That's you know exactly the case. Many developers... Uh, come and go. They're working on this or that extension to SSL. So they swing by the open SSL project, graft on their new widget for live testing because it's, you know, it's like a great armature for that. Uh, then they leave it hanging there without anyone to care for it moving forward. Um, and it's really kind of amazing that it's done as well as it has. As a consequence, Today, where there was once one, there are now many. Google forked OpenSSL to create, <laughs> I love the name, Boring SSL. Uh, the OpenBSD project also forked it to create Libre SSL. And Leo, you and I talked about how Amazon took a different approach for, curing, for securing the communications to their cloud services by creating a minimal subset 
of the whole named S2, the numeral 2N. And remember that that stands for signal to noise because the, the point was, you know, open SSL is like it's so much code to, to do TLS that if you just said, ah, let's start over, you could get a much better signal to noise ratio uh, for your for your library. Uh, and then just recently, Google has created and released something we have not spoken about before, which is Tink, T-I-N-K which is their new multi-language cross-platform crypto library that can do uh, uh, TLS uh, connections and, and, uh, and gives applications access to that security. So there's all of those. And then there's GNU TLS, which is the subject here. Uh, it was first created a little over 17 years ago, back in 2003. Um, it, that happened as a means for allowing the GNU project applications the ability to communicate securely over SSL and TLS. Although OpenSSL existed at the time, OpenSSL's license was not compatible with the GPL. Therefore, software license under the GPL, such as all of GNU's software, could not use OpenSSL without making a GPL linking exception. The GNU TLS library was licensed originally under the GNU Lesser General Public License version 2, which included applications using the GNU General Public License. Then in August of 2011, the library was updated to LGPL version 3, <laughs> but once it was noticed that there were new license compatibility problems introduced, especially with other free software, with the license change in 2013, the license was returned to uh, version 2.1. So that's where we are now. One way or the other, under one license or another, GNU TLS has been around since 2003. And not surprisingly, it has found its way into a great many applications. Um, just to get everyone's attention, I'll name a few. Apt, Cadaver, which is web, WebDAV, essentially, Curl, WGET, Git, Gnome, wow. CenterIM, XIM, WeChat, MariaDB, Mandos, Mutt, Wireshark, RSyslog, SLRN, Lynx, Cups, GnoMint, GNU Emacs, SlapD, Samda, the Synology Disk Station Manager, OpenConnect, and a whole bunch of various VNC implementations. So, yeah, you know, it's the way you do TLS if you want something that's compatible with the GPL. Um, uh, and this is why it's worth taking note and looking into the situation more closely, when the result of the recent audit of GNU TLS is, is summed up with two words, be afraid. That's, that's, oh, boy. that's not what you want from, <laughs> no. the, from the auditors of your, your TLS library. So Linux users need to determine how afraid they individually should be if at all, maybe the, the things they've had are already patched because this is a, a few weeks ago. Uh, NIST explains the problem very dryly by writing, quote, GNU TLS 3.6.x before 3.6.14 uses incorrect cryptography, which is a nice way of putting it, as we'll see, for encrypting a session ticket. They said a loss of confidentiality in TLS 1.2 and an authentication bypass in TLS 1.3, neither of which you want in TLS, of course. The earliest affected version is 3.6.4, which was released in uh, August 24th, oh no, September 24th of 2018. They said because of an error in a commit at 2018-09-18, until the first 
key rotation after a connection to a TLS server based on this library, uh, it always uses wrong data in place of an encryption key derived from an application based on the library. So in other words, to make this a little less dry, when the news of these audit results broke, the cryptographer Filippo Valsorda, who's Google's security team lead for Go, their Go language, he tweeted, <laughs> don't rely on GNU TLS, please. Then he says, CVE 2020-13777, whoops, for the past 10 releases, most TLS 1.0 through 1.2 connections could be passively decrypted, meaning all you need to do is capture the traffic. He says, and most TLS 1.3 connections intercepted trivially. And he says, as an aside, also TLS version 1.2 to 1.0 session tickets are awful, but that's another issue. So I have a link to the, uh, the NIST announcement and the GNU TLS audit. Um, someone who's hip to security quoted Filippo's tweet, and he wrote, You are reading this correctly. <laughs> Supposedly encrypted TLS connections made with affected GNU TLS releases are vulnerable to a passive clear text recovery attack and active for 1.3, meaning active attacks for TLS 1.3, he says, but, but who uses that anyway? He says, this is extremely bad. It's pretty close to just switching everyone to HTTP instead of HTTPS, more or less. He says, I would have a lot more to say about the security of GNU TLS in particular and security in general, but I am mostly concerned about patching holes in the roof right now, meaning... How is he affected by this? He says, so this article is not about that. He says, this article is about figuring out what exactly was exposed in our infrastructure because of this. So again, I have a log to his full coverage. There are some, some for example, if you're using uh, Debian, there are some commands you can use uh, with, the packet, with the package manager to quickly discover which packages you have installed which link to any of the affected versions of GNU TLS, which would tell you what you currently have. As I said, you know, this is now a few weeks ago. So I would imagine that there's been a lot of GNU TLS updating and relinking and package reissuing and updates. So you, the real takeaway for this is just make sure that you, the Linux you're running is has been recently checked for any uh, any libraries uh, that use GNU TLS and that they've been updated. Uh, and if you are, for you know, a builder, if you're if you're using it yourself, you want to make sure you are up to date with the latest um, because this was a re <laughs> a really bad problem since uh, I guess. September of 2018 for all of the instances of GNU TLS that have, you know, been out there, a, a trivial uh, plain text attack on the initial cipher. So very embarrassing. Um, oh, and a bit later, summing things up, he writes, the impact of this vulnerability depends upon the affected packages and how they're used. He says it can, it can range from meh, Someone knows I downloaded that Debian package yesterday to, holy crap, my full disk encryption passwords are compromised. I need to re-encrypt all my drives. Because, for example, one of the things that relies on GNU TLS was, I mentioned it, uh, what was the name of that? Uh, it's, the full, it's the disk encryption package, uh, Mandos. Uh, so, uh, uh, 
Oh, and including I need to change all LDAP and uh, MySQL passwords, which uh, could have been impacted too. So anyway, uh, just a heads up for Linux users, uh, GNU TLS is probably uh, been there and you want to make sure that it's been updated since then. Uh, uh, the Garmin outage. And I put outage in quotes because, okay, yeah. I mean, technically that's correct. Um, a screenshot from Garmin.com anytime between last Wednesday, late last Wednesday, and probably Sunday uh, stated, a red banner across the top, we are currently experiencing an outage that affects Garmin.com and Garmin Connect. This outage also affects our call centers, and we are currently unable to receive any calls, emails, or online chats. We are working to resolve this issue as quickly as possible and apologize for this inconvenience. And then in the show notes, I have and now. And we can see this is a picture of my uh, browser where the first tab is not in focus. It says security now, number 777-072820. And the tab next to it is www.garmin.com which is updated. It says, we are happy to report that many of the systems and services affected by the recent outage, including Garmin Connect, are returning to operation. Some features still have temporary limitations while all the data is being processed. <clears throat> and by that, we probably mean decrypted. <clears throat> We'd like to thank all our customers for your patience and understanding. Click for more details. So, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, after last year's overkill on coverage of ransomware, because it was, you know, it just took off last summer, as I mentioned, I promised to stop mentioning this scourge of the industry week after week. And I've been good since then. Even though ransomware attacks form a constant background, it's like, yeah, okay, fine. You know, and it's true. Uh, if some random dentist in Hoboken needs to cancel his appointments because his office has been hit, uh, if, if indeed he's still in business after the novel coronavirus hit, uh, and I agree that there are more pressing matters for this podcast's attention. However, when a high-profile, highly networked, internet-connected and internet dependent giant like Garmin gets its servers encrypted and needs to go dark, well, that's worthy of a mention. Uh, the troubles began late Wednesday and early Thursday morning as customers reported being unable to use a variety of their services. This came as no surprise to Garmin, uh, and they tweeted at the time. I have their, I grabbed their their tweet for the show notes, basically the, it amounts to the message that they put across the banner of their website. So I won't read it again. Um, this service failure left their millions of customers unable to connect their smartwatches, their fitness trackers, and whatever other devices to Garmin's servers and network that provided location-based data uh, that in some cases is required to make them work. And although many within the industry suspected exactly what it turns out by all reports, uh, internal and external, did happen, Garmin's post yesterday was the first the company provided. Yesterday, as in Tuesday, I mean, as in Monday, uh, the 27th, their Garmin's post was the first that actually gave us an official notification of the of what caused the worldwide outage. They said, Garmin Limited was the victim of a cyber attack that encrypted some of our systems on July 23rd, 2020. As a result, many of our online services were interrupted, including website functions, customer support, customer-facing applications, and, co and company communications. 
we immediately began to assess the nature of the attack and started remediation. We have no indication that any customer data, including payment information from Garmin Pay, was accessed, lost, or stolen. Additionally, the functionality of Garmin products was not affected, other than the ability to access online services. Affected systems are being restored, and we expect to return to normal operation over the next few days. As our affected systems are restored, we expect some delays as the backlog of information is being processed. We're grateful to our customers' patience and understanding during this incident and look forward to continuing to provide the exceptional customer service and support that has been our hallmark and tradition. So, screenshots which appeared and other data posted by employees suggested the ransomware was a relatively new strain called Wasted Locker. A person with direct knowledge of Garmin's response over the weekend confirmed that Wasted Locker was indeed the ransomware used. The person spoke on condition of anonymity to discuss this confidential matter with the technical press. Wasted Locker first came to public attention just two and a half weeks ago on July 10th when Malwarebytes published what they called a one of their threat spotlight profiles. I have a link to the entire threat spotlight in the show notes for anyone who wants the full details. In their spotlight, Malwarebytes said that wasted locker attacks are highly targeted against organizations chosen in advance. And what we're about to learn, as exactly as you were saying, Leo, this represents a change in the terrain of and the application and deployment of ransomware. They, so they said, highly targeted against organizations chosen in advance. During the initial intrusion, the malware conducts a detailed analysis of active network defenses so that subsequent penetrations can better circumvent them. So this is no longer an opportunistic botnet spray looking for things to infect. This is different. Uh, uh, Peter Arntz, a Malwarebytes researcher, wrote, quote, In general, we can state that if this gang has found an entrance into your network, it will be impossible to stop them from encrypting at least part of your files. The only thing that can help you salvage your files in such a case is if you, is if you have either rollback technology or a form of offline backups. With online or otherwise connected backups, you run the chance of your backup files being encrypted as well, which makes the whole point of having them moot. Please note that the rollback techniques are reliant on the activity of the processes monitoring your systems. And the danger exists that these processes will be on the target list of the ransomware gang, meaning that these processes will be shut down once they gain access to your network. So Malwarebytes posting also notes, Wasted Locker is a new ransomware operated by a malware exploitation gang commonly known as, <laughs> and I'm not kidding, Evil Corp. The same gang that is associated with the Drydex and BitPamer malware. The attribution is not based on the malware variants, as Wasted Locker is very different from BitPamer. What was retained was the ability to add specific modules for different targets. The attacks performed using Wasted Locker are highly targeted at very specific organizations. It is suspected, they wrote, that during a first penetration attempt, an assessment of active defenses is made, and the next attempt will be specifically designed to circumvent the active security software and other perimeter protection 
which the initial foray found to be in use. This effort represents a new and clear escalation of the ransomware scourge. We're no longer looking at opportunistic attacks which ask for some fraction of a Bitcoin. If reports are to be believed, including the U.S. Department of Treasury, the bad guys are now highly organized Russian cyber criminal gangs. They're not screwing around. The name Wasted Locker is derived from the file name it creates, which includes an abbreviation of the victim's name and the string Wasted. For each encrypted file, the attackers create a separate file that contains the ransomware note. The ransom note has the same name as the associated file with the addition of underscore info. Once the Wasted Locker gang have taken hold in a network, their demands typically range from 500000 to $10 million. And as we know, Leo, uh, sometimes even more. Um, so this is the new face of international cybercrime extortion. If hackers delete or steal a company's data, there's nothing to extort. But if hackers encrypt a corporation's data, they're able to dangle the carrot of the decryption key. It's diabolical. Garman's notice yesterday did not employ the terms ransomware or wasted locker, but the description cyber attack that encrypted some of our systems all but definitively confirms that ransomware of some sort was behind the outage. And we have disclosures from unnamed but presumably reliable Garmin insiders to further confirm it. We all want to know whether or not Garmin paid up or restored from backups. And if they antied up, what did they pay? Sky News, citing a number of unnamed security sources, reported that Garmin did obtain the decryption key. And that report matched what the person with direct knowledge mm. told members of the tech so press as paid. well. They paid. Yep. yep. Sky News said Garmin, quote, did not directly make a payment to the hackers, unquote, but did not elaborate further. However, as we've discussed on the podcast before, there are now middlemen agencies who negotiate on behalf of their ransomware victim clients. Payment may have been made through such an intermediary. Garmin's representatives declined to provide confirmation that the malware was wasted locker and whether or not the company paid ransom. And, you know, there's no benefit to them elaborating. And, in fact, it might actually cause them some trouble. On December 5th of last year, the U.S. Department of Treasury officially sanctioned Russia's evil corp, citing a Russia-based cybercriminal group as being behind the Drydex malware. Uh, US Depart the U.S. Treasury Department's announcement started off by saying, today, the U.S. Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, OFAC, took action against Evil Corp, the Russia-based cybercriminal organization responsible for the development and distribution of the Drydex malware. Evil Corp has used the Drydex malware to infect computers and harvest login credentials from hundreds of banks and financial institutions in over 40 countries, resulting in more than $100 million in theft. And it goes on, but that's enough to give us a, a taste for it. So the U.S. Treasury's action could complicate Garmin's position with respect to Evil Corp, presumably if a if a company is sanctioned, uh, U.S. businesses are no longer allowed to have any commerce with it. And I guess one could argue that this, you know, paying paying extortion is commerce. Um, so uh, anyway, today Garmin's services are now mostly back online. As we know, and as we've commented before, attacks are driven by motivation. And few things motivate like cold, hard cash. Ransomware has emerged as an insidious but viable technique for the extraction of cash from those who have it and those who have been 
caught without adequate fail-safe fallbacks in the event of such an intrusion. And as our listeners know, when ransomware first appeared, uh, we covered it on the pod- on the podcast, and our reaction was, "Uh oh," <laughs> because it was clear that in-place encryption coupled with cyber currency enabled this significant new threat. And now to that, we add tightly targeted attacks launched by international organized cybercrime groups. So staying current with security updates, keeping employees on guard against intrusion spoofs, which as we know is the way 90% of these intrusions begin, uh, and maintaining offline backups in the case bad guys get in anyway is the order of the day. And thus ends our ransomware reminder wake-up call for 2020. Lord. It's really a problem, Leo. I mean, you know, we've talked about how porous security inherently is. Uh, that uh, if somebody wants badly enough to get in, they can find a way. And it's clear that, uh, you know, we, don't, we, don't, we know nothing about the way they got in at Garmin. Uh, we did discover ultimately how the how Sony was breached. Um, it's it's typically somebody doing something they shouldn't on the inside, mm. but boy, is it expensive. Mm. And and you know we, we saw government institutions last year, lots of school districts that that are cash strapped and didn't have the money to. Uh, invest in IT. It, I mean, it's expensive to create and, and, and it's difficult to think about all the workstations that are spread throughout a company like Garmin that, that where something, some malware could get a foothold, then start looking around, under, you know, map out the network, figure out where things are, uh, laterally move within the network unseen until they figure out exactly what's going on. And then, you know, I'm wondering why they didn't, you know, wait until late Friday night, why the attack took place on a Wednesday night. It would seem to me that, you know, the weekend is more disruptive. But anyway, I don't want to give them any ideas. Just amazing. Incredible. Um, so Cisco, unfortunately... Uh, speaking of going where the money is and limiting ingress to high-value targets, we have the sad patching status of Cisco's most recent critical vulnerability uh, within tasty enterprise-grade devices. And when I tell you that it's yet another directory path traversal mistake, everybody try not to roll your eyes. It is. Last Wednesday, the 22nd, Cisco released their security advisory with a CVSS score of 7.5. That's seeming somewhat worse, uh, or things are seeming somewhat worse than that today. Cisco's advisory reads, a vulnerability in the web services interface of Cisco adaptive security application and Cisco Firepower Threat Defense software could allow an unauthenticated remote attacker to conduct directory traversal attacks and read sensitive files on a targeted system. The vulnerability, they wrote, is due to a lack of proper input validation of URLs in HTTP requests processed by an affected device. An attacker could exploit this vulnerability by sending a crafted HTTP request containing directory traversal character sequences to an affected device. A successful exploit could allow the attacker to view arbitrary files within the web services file system on the targeted device. The web services file system is enabled when the affected device is configured with either WebVPN or any connect features. This vulnerability cannot be used to obtain access to ASA or FTD system files or under op or underlying OS files. 
They said Cisco has released software updates that address this vulnerability. There are no workarounds that address it. Then, in an update to this an initial disclosure, they said, note, Cisco has become aware of the availability of public exploit code and active exploitation of the vulnerability that is ascribed in this advisory. Cisco encourages customers with affected products to upgrade to a fixed release as soon as possible. Well, <laughs> over time... This podcast has compiled a few golden rules of cybersecurity. I may not have explicitly stated this one, but it clearly ranks among the most important. Web interfaces are dangerous. Don't use them. Oh, yeah, they're pretty, and they mean that the IT guys don't need to read yet another boring manual listing confusing-looking commands. No, a web, interfe a web interface means that you can just fire it up and poke around in the menus until you find the button you're looking for, then press it. Unfortunately, so too can the bad guys. And one well-established golden rule, as we know, is that interpreters are incredibly difficult to make perfect. Yet perfection there is required because the job being performed by most interpreters asks them to interpret untrusted content. And the interpreter in any web server is right up there in complexity and exploitability with that of any multimedia codec that we've run across. So a web server is an interpreter, though it is inherently facing the public internet, and it is inherently accepting untrusted content from anybody who wants to send it an HTTP URL. Well, it turns out that this one also has a directory traversal vulnerability, meaning that you're able to put in the URL, as we know, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, in order to back out of the root directory of the HTTP server back to the actual root of the file system and then move forward down a, drif a different branch of the directory that you're never supposed to, as a remote, untrusted user on the internet, get to. So, uh, Mikhail uh, Kaluchnikov of Positive Technologies, who was credited with independently reporting this flaw, along with Ahmed Abul Ila, of who, who's with Red Force, said, this vulnerability is highly dangerous. The cause is a failure to sufficiently verify inputs. An attacker can send a specially crafted HTTP request to gain access to the file system, which stores data in RAM, the so-called RAM FS, RAM FS. So last week, at the time of the disclosure, no attacks were known to be underway. But Ahmed Abu Ila of Red Force released a proof of concept which, which demonstrated the vulnerability. And he's been tweeting up a storm of example ways to exploit the flaw ever since. The bad news is it's horrifically easy to exploit this problem. This is Cisco. <clears throat> and also horrifically trivial to find vulnerable targets, which brings us to the state of affairs as of today. It's not good. As the update to Cisco's vulnerability announcement noted, attacks are underway. Rapid7 jumped on this and took a look at what it meant. In their report from last Thursday, they noted, Rapid7 encourages immediate patching of vulnerable ASA FTD installations to prevent attackers from obtaining sensitive information from these devices, which may then be used in targeted attacks. In other words, exactly what the evil corp in Russia, cyber gang, is looking for. He, Rapid7 said, and, and echoing Cisco, there are no workarounds that address this vulnerability, meaning, you know, it's a core problem in the parser, the URL parser of the HTTP web server in these Cisco appliances. Rapid7 said Cisco has provided fixes for all supported versions, blah, blah, blah. 
Rapid 7's project Sonar discovered <laughs> just over 85,000, Leo, of these ASA FTT devices. And 398 of them are spread across 17% of the Fortune 500. Since it is difficult, if not impossible, to legally fingerprint Cisco ASA FTT versions remotely, in other words, so as to determine what version they are running, Rapid7 Labs revisited what's known as the uptime technique described in a 2016 blog post for another Cisco ASA vulnerability a couple of years ago, four years ago. That shows, using the uptime technique, it shows that only 10% of affected Cisco devices have been rebooted since the release of this patch. In other words, 10% of 85,000 vulnerable devices have been rebooted since the release of the patch. Um, uh, in their note, they said, rebooting is a likely indicator that they've been patched, um, yet only 27 of the 398 that are detected within Fortune 500 companies appear to have been patched and rebooted. So again, it's not possible to say this too often. Nothing is more important than making sure you've got open lines of communication to the software, software and hardware vendors of the equipment you're using and to have somebody who's on like a, like absolutely at like, watching this stuff. This cannot go to some neglected email account that, that the IT team checks on every week. One week is no longer fast enough. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, it should be clear to everyone by now that a vulnerability is no longer a surprise exception. You know, j just ask Microsoft on, on any uh, Patch Tuesday. Um, and I can imagine that Dynamic update and patch management could become a job title. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it does. Um, one piece of miscellany, uh, and I can't vouch for this. Uh, it's called Bloatbox. Uh, De-bloating Windows 10 after installation and before getting down to any serious business has become something of like what any serious user needs to do. It's, it's, you know, every time I install Windows 10, and I've got a bunch of installations around now doing different things, stripping all of the junk off of it is really what you have to do before you sit down to get any serious work done. Um, over time, I've assembled a few, a few tools to do this. I know, Leo, you've talked about some PowerShell scripts. I, I have them too. Uh, and basically, they amount to some some PowerShell commands with wildcards for please remove everything. Uh, and then there are a few extra things because, for example, things like connect, which is extra stubborn and needs a little extra coaching in order to get it to leave. Uh, but so far, the available utilities for accomplishing these tasks have left me unimpressed. Uh, I'm hoping that this one will be different. It's, it's not clear. And again, I just wanted to put it on everyone's radar. Uh, it's a newly released open source tool called Bloatbox. It's up on GitHub. If you just Google Bloatbox, uh, the first link is, is to it. Um, I've not had the occasion to use it yet, so I'm not vouching for it. And one concern is that it might be digging a bit too deep. So don't tell your unsophisticated users about it. Uh, in the scam, in the sample screenshot that you've got on on the screen right now, Leo, uh, I see options to remove various versions of Microsoft Net Native Framework and the Fluent XAML Theme Editor and more. Those are things that probably ought to remain where they are. So I would advise caution and only remove things that are recognizable, that are in your face and are annoying you. Uh, still, Bloatbox might be worth a look. I'll be on the lookout 
for any tweet, uh, for any Twitter feedback about it from any of our listeners who do check it out. Uh, and the next time I'm facing a start menu loaded with flippy animated tiles pushing Candy Crush Soda Saga, uh, I will definitely give it a try myself. Uh, at, and then I will re re report back what I find. Um, you know, I've been tempted to do something to fix this, but I know that our listeners would rather have me continuing to work on getting spin right out the door. Um, I did have a piece of errata that I thought was interesting and definitely worth sharing from a David A. Wheeler. Uh, he tweeted, uh, I guess he DM'd. He said, hi, you've been claiming in security now that the CVE number after the year is in sequential order. He says, that has not been true for a long time. There are too many CVEs for one organization to assign them all. So there are now many CVE numbering authorities, known as CNAs, each of which is given a block of integers to assign. So it's no longer as simple as number after year indicates order or indicates the number of vulnerabilities this year. So, David, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we, we know that we do have a phenomenal number and that the, the total count uh, is going up rapidly. Uh, but uh, gl good to know that uh, if, if you were pulling CVEs from somebody who hadn't issued many and got a low number block, that could be happening late in the year, even though the, the number was low. So thank you. And Leo, let's take our last break. And I'm going to... Uh, introduce our listeners to something uh, they're really going to want to get their hands on because this, uh -huh. this benchmark is really revealing some interesting things. Cool. Very interesting. Meanwhile, I'll talk about men's health. Uh, the folks at Roman have created over the last couple of years a really remarkable digital health clinic for men. And I think men need this because, uh, well, first of all, everybody needs a digital health clinic these days. Wouldn't you prefer doing that than going into a doctor's office? But men especially, I think we're kind of conditioned to be um, stoic, you know. We're taught in, you know, Little League to rub some dirt on it or walk it off. You know, there's no crying in baseball, that kind of thing. And it, it, it continues on as you get to be a, a grown-up. You, you say, it'll get better. I know I tell my wife, it'll get better all the time. I say, oh, it's... She says, you should see a doctor about that. I said, nah, nah, it's fine. <laughs> well, there are some things that won't get better. And some things, even if they do get better, you should probably check with a doctor about. One of them, erectile dysfunction. Embarrassing, I know. No one wants to talk about it. It's awkward. Um, nevertheless, it can be a sign of underlying conditions. And it's certainly nothing anybody these days has to suffer with. There's a simple, convenient s solution to get the treatment you need without leaving the house. Our friends at Roman have it for you. It's a digital platform that will connect you with a licensed doctor in your state from the comfort of your home. You get incredible care, but you also get the meds you need if the doctor feels you need the treatment. Uh, discreet, professional care, genuine prescription medication, uh, or over-the-counter treatments. They have a variety of conditions they work with, not just ED, not just sexual health, S hair, skin, dandruff, eczema, daily health like prostate health, bone health, supplements. I take a testosterone supplement that's a not a prescription T supplement, but actually just uh, vitamins that really do seem to help. It's just fantastic. Roman makes it convenient to get the treatment you need right from your home. You go to your phone, go to your computer, complete the free online visit, You'll hear back from a U.S. licensed physician within 24 hours. And if the doctor decides the treatment's right for you, your medication can be shipped right to your door with free two-day shipping. They offer generics as well, by the way. This is kind of a change in ED, and it's really saving a lot of money. You can also get free unlimited follow-ups with your doctor anytime you have questions. Free, or if you want to adjust your treatment plan. Really, this is all about getting men the care we need. No commitments. You can cancel any time. Roman is a great place to be the source of your wellness. If you're struggling with ED, no shame, no need to be embarrassed, but you should get it looked at. Uh, go to GetRoman.com slash security now for a free online visit and free two-day shipping. The, I've said this, mentioned this before, but, and maybe you saw the TV ads, but Roman was founded by a young guy who was suffering from ED in his 20s. His father, who was a physician, said that's actually 
could be more serious. They got a workup. He had undiagnosed heart disease. They got it solved. But that's why you got to pay attention to this stuff. You can't just rub some dirt on it and walk it off. It's okay to go to a doctor. And with Roman, it's easy. Get Roman.com slash security now. Free online visit, free two-day shipping. Get Roman. Dot com slash security now. We thank you so much for your support uh, of the show by using that address. Get Roman.com slash security now. And you're taking care of yourself. And that's a good thing. On we go, Mr. Steve Gibson. So uh, this benchmarking software has evolved into a surprisingly accurate measure of performance. Uh, it's a bit like having access to a high-resolution microscope. Uh, and as a result, we've been discovering some very interesting and surprising things. Um, I have tables in the show notes, which our listeners will probably want to take a look at. You might want to stick them on screen, that first one. Um, that's the result of seven, seven separate runs of the benchmark against a system containing a 10 terabyte Seagate spinning drive and a half a terabyte crucial SSD. Now, remember that the earliest hard disk drives maintained uh, either a 17 sectors per track, which were MFM, or 26 sectors if they were RLL. That's why they got that 50% increase in density by using run length limited encoding. So that was the number of sectors per revolution. And they had the same number of sectors around the innermost cylinder as around the outermost. Remember, and we've all sort of seen the original pictures of a, of a pie slice hard drive where, where the slices represent the sectors. Um, but that meant that the bit density of the bits around the inner cylinder set the bit rate for the drive that is the maximum density for the drive, and that the same number of bits were more greatly spread out around the outer cylinder, because of course the outer cylinder has a much greater circumference than the inner cylinder. That clearly wastes space. So all of today's modern drives vary the number of sectors around the track, depending upon the track's length. And that varies with the track's position on the drive, of course. So as a consequence, a modern hard drive's data transfer rate will also vary with the position of the track on the drive. So this chart uh, was, it was, was the result of, as I said, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven runs of this benchmark on a 10 terabyte Seagate drive. Uh, in order to get a sense for this, I recently added position dependence into the benchmark. But what was initially happening was I was using a random position and people were saying, hey, you know, I'm getting different results every time I run the benchmark. And I, th and I of course, knew why, but I thought it would be interesting to, to have the benchmark take readings at different locations in the hard drive. And as we can see from the table above, uh, the position where the benchmark is taken greatly affects the data transfer rate. I'm, I'm measuring at zero, at 25% into the drive, at 50% into the drive, 75% and 100%. So basically five places uh, at the very, at, you know, at, at, quarter spreads. Um, and as we would predict, the actual data transfer rate drops off as we move in toward the inner cylinders. In the case of this 10 terabyte Seagate drive, the back of the drive runs at about 46% of the throughput compared to the front of the drive. And so this suggests that for a spinning drive, moving the most often accessed data to the front can more than double the drive's actual throughput compared with data located at the end of the drive. Um, and notice something else in that table that I'm quite proud of, the, and that is the remarkable run-to-run -run repeatability of the benchmark's results. 
I mean, they're in the case of the 50 percent uh, point, they're all 205.3 megabytes per second. Uh, the 75 percent, all 170 megabytes per second, with one of them at 169.6. And at the 100 percent point, 112.7 megabytes per second, with two of them at 112.6. So basically four digits of accuracy from the benchmark, which is what, first of all, lets us believe the numbers, and also it becomes sensitive enough for us to see things that we otherwise would not have noted, um, which takes us to the second chart showing on that same system seven runs of the 512 gigabyte crucial SSD. Um, we see the same uh, sort of inter-test repeatability Basically, the the success the seven successive tests are are identical, but something that's really interesting that I first noted here and that a lot of our of the testers have been noting is that the front of the SSD is significantly slower than than later in the SSD. Um, what we think this shows is there is fatiguing. Being, there is fatiguing occurring at the front of the SSD, which is reducing its performance. We know that, that there is uh, active write leveling that goes on in order to swap regions around so that one region that is being written often doesn't die. Instead, the, the SSD controller is, is remapping the regions of the SSD Transparently, it's not something that 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 there there's any UI for uh, at the at the interface to the drive, but what what we believe this means is that this this wear leveling is not global in nature; it's local in nature. So there is a limit to the to the reach of the leveling across the drive. There are. I think the, the the most consistent performers we've seen have been Samsung SSDs, the, you know, the high end ones, the the 560 and five, uh, uh, yeah, uh, with no, I guess it's is eight, uh, 850, 850, 860, 860, and 870. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They EVOs. really do seem to be doing a uh, a better job. Good, because that's uh, the ones I buy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I just think I, I believe in Samsung's uh, technology, and then. In this last uh, table is something else that we've seen, which is really interesting. So we've got a super accurate throughput benchmark giving us four digits of accuracy. Uh, we had one of our testers who has a system with four identical two terabyte Seagate drives run the benchmark three times. So he produced three sets of benchmarks for each drive. This table, he rearranged them by drive. So it's a three benchmarks for the first drive. And in fact, in the table, you can see the P column is the SATA port that the drive is on. The S is the SATA speed. So SATA 3, SATA 2. And in fact, we had one tester, didn't know it, but he had a SATA 3 capable SSD on a SATA 2 port that he'd never noticed. The benchmark showed him that he was on that this SATA 3 device was on a SATA 2 port. And in fact, the next version will explicitly notify you if you have that kind of speed mismatch. He moved his SSD from SATA 2 to SATA 3 and more than doubled the measured throughput for that device. So that was a nice little benefit. But look at these numbers uh, in this last chart. We see the, the, the four groups of three for each of the drives. The, with the, 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 the retest of, of a given drive shows almost identical results. But these four identical drives are showing differing performances at the zero the 25, the 50, the 75, and the 100 percent points. Uh, for example, one of them shows uh, right at the front 166 
at the zero. Another one is 174. Another one is 167. And another one is 158. So they're the identical drive. The retest is the same, but the three drives differ. And they differ differently across their area. So what could account for the, for, for the precise performance of identical drives staying consistent for each drive but differing from the others? What differs from one drive to the next? What has always differed from one drive to the next? The number and the location of physical surface defects. This benchmark is revealing the subtle transfer timing variations which result from physical sector remapping around the defects. The location and number of defects differs from one drive to the next. No two are going to be the same, but of course they remain fixed for any single drive. At the moment, I'm performing the benchmark by taking 32 consecutive back-to-back 32 megabyte transfers of 65536 sectors each. So that's a one gig. So I'm doing a one gig read at the beginning, a one gig at the 25% point, one gig at the 50, one gig at the 75, and at the, at the 100. Um, I've proven that I'm eliminating all inter-transfer overhead. No revolutions are being lost between blocks. So I'm streaming data off the drive at its maximum theoretical performance. And of course, I developed all this for Spinrite because this is what's going to make Spinrite 6.1 scream. Um, and for the benchmark, I've achieved a timing resolution down to the hundreds of picoseconds of accuracy, which is how I'm able to get the, the actual throughput readings so you know, just dead on and repeatable run after run. Um, but I mentioned that I have an idea for an improvement because these timing irregularities have raised some interesting questions by next week's podcast, although I promise not to take up so much time. Um, I will have changed the test to 33 consecutive back-to-back -back transfers, adding one. Um, and I plan to snapshot the exact instant where the interblock of the where of the 32 interblocks occurs so that we can more granularly see how each of the 32 32 megabyte transfers flow um, and I'm going to use that first uh, transfer that, that the 33rd in front so that I can discard the first one that way the benchmark will be able to eliminate any head seek time and rotational latencies from the start of each block, which I'm not eliminating now. Um, so that way the block won't, the benchmark won't start timing until the first block is discarded uh, and that 32 megabytes has been read. So uh, as I mentioned before, the idea of creating a mass storage benchmark like this started out kind of as a bit of a Trojan horse you know, an inducement for our listeners to obtain some value in return for their effort of formatting and booting a USB stick to run the benchmark on their various hardware systems. In the process of doing that, they would be verifying for me that Spinrite's new suite of bare metal, no BIOS drivers, of which this AHCI driver is the last and final that I need to develop, are working for them. Uh, and thus proving that Spinrite will work for them too. But it's looking like this hyper-accurate storage benchmark is going to wind up providing some very interesting information for its users. So my original plan for a comparison, uh, a companion web forum, was to help in managing any problems that people had with the benchmark. But I think we're going to also need a place to discuss people's interesting findings as they use this. So anyway... I just thought our listeners would find that interesting. Cool. Uh, very, very cool timing results. Yeah. Um, and a very cool show. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <clears throat> we do spin the uh, Security <laughs> Now bottle every uh, every Tuesday, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 
2030 UTC. If you want to tune in, you can watch us make the show live at twit.tv slash live. There's audio and video streams there. Uh, Steve has copies of the show, though. You can always download those at his website. He's got 16 kilobit audio, 64 kilobit audio, and transcripts. Uh, really a nice feature. That's all at grc.com. While you're there, pick up Spinrite, the world's best hard drive maintenance and recovery utility. Keep up on the updates uh, on Spinrite 6.1 as he works on it. Participate if you want. In fact, if you pick up 6.0 now, you can participate in the development of 6.1 and uh, be part of the team. That's all at grc.com, along with a lot of great freebies as well. On-demand versions of the show at our website as well, twit.tv slash sn. We've got 64 kilobit audio and video. We also uh, put it up on YouTube. You can watch it there if you want in a variety of formats to fit the device you're watching. And, uh, of course, if you have a podcast application, the easiest thing to do would be just subscribe. That way you get it automatically the minute it's available every Tuesday afternoon. Steve, we'll see you uh, back here for seven, seven, eight. And you know, Leo, in the over the course, we're we're coming in here on the end of year fifteen. That happens next month. Yes. And I, it occurred to me that over the course of the last fifteen years, the world has changed a lot, and there may actually be a reduced need for sixteen kilobit audio uh, now. Does anybody download years. it? You must have numbers. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we do get downloads. I, I I actually bounce them through. I guess I'm still bouncing them through PotTrack. Uh, oh, okay. You guys are no, we don't use on. them I think, anymore. <laughs> I think the links still work. <laughs> um, actually, well, that's an interesting point. Uh, we have new redirects. I don't suppose anybody, Patrick, if you're listening, make sure you get Steve the uh, redirects. We don't use PotTrack anymore. Yeah, all of the high resolution actually just go to you. I'm using the same link you guys it's are using. It's just for the so, 16. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that, actually, I'd be really curious to see. I, <laughs> probably probably doesn't infect the uh, results. Probably much. not a yeah. big demographic, yeah. no. Yeah. We'll send you the new uh, redirects because we go we have different redirects these days. Thank and, you, Steve. And just so all of our, our Linux listeners know, I am not recommending RWX, RWX, RWX. Never. That is, that is not a good idea. You know, that's not the way you want to leave your... The your, only time I ever computer. do that... Seven seven seven. Is if I'm so frustrated, like you get anything <laughs> just, working, and you just go ch mod dash r seven seven seven. Yep. Do it to everything, and then I can figure out after the fact. Actually, there's some programs. It's interesting. Uh, GPG GNU Privacy uh, Guard, which is the open source PGP, will complain. I think SSH will as well. If it has It'll look if at unsafe it's permissions setting. on. Yes. Uh, folders and files which i think is really great Very yeah nice. yeah that's a nice that's a nice feature thank you steve we'll see you next time hey buddy Let's next week. Now. Bye. i'm jason howell host of tech news weekly here on twit.tv along with my co-host micah Sargent. each and every week we talk to people who are making and breaking the tech news it could be journalists writing amazing tech stories it could be experts it could be the sources of the stories themselves, developers, you name it. We bring them onto the show and we talk to them about why their story is resonating with the world. You can watch and subscribe by going to twit.tv slash TNW. Make sure you do that and you won't miss a single episode. We'll see you there. Security now.